Um, hopefully, uh, there we are. There Great. We are. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have been reminding people, please sign into the virtual blue sheets, uh, which are at this Cody MD link. Um, we have a note taker. Uh, just here's the note well. Is the, uh, reminder is the of the GF policies, such as the patent policy. And oh, sorry, is somebody asking a question? Yeah, this is Barry. Is the link posted anywhere I can click on it? Um, it in the chat here. If you open the chat window. Chat here. Where do I find uh, it? Lower, lower left. You see, you should see a thing that looks like a dialog box. Uh, 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 like okay. A, it didn't look chatty to me. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, so about, more about the note well. Uh, it's set forth in BCP 79. As a reminder, you, when you're participating, you agree to follow ITF processes and policies. Definitive information is in the documents listed below and other ITF BCPs. Uh, if you want advice, please talk to the chairs or the ADs. All right. So a few tips about this virtual meeting. Um, it is session is being recorded. We've turned that on. There's no registration required to attend the meeting, so hopefully you've gotten in. Um, but you do need to fill in the virtual blue sheets and uh, actually, data, uh, I, actually, you can just fill in the virtual blue sheets without a data tracker login. Uh, so that's not needed, I don't think. Uh, could be wrong. Um, and then uh, if you want to join the session Jabber Room, you can do that via the ITF data tracker meeting icon uh, by clicking on that. That'll get you in the Jabber Room. Please use headphones or an echo canceling speakerphone. Uh, state your full name before speaking. Um, a few other little things. Uh, to enter the queue, uh, you type plus Q in the chat. I guess, uh, Jonathan, you'll handle the queue. And you leave it by sure. typing minus Q. Um, if we do have a hum, I'm not sure we will. You raise your hand with a hand raising tool and lower it by clicking on the hand raising tool again. Um, and when you're called on, you need to enable your audio if you've muted yourself. And to do that, you click on the mute unmute icon. Um, you don't have to use video if you don't want to, and many of you are not. So that's I think you've got that. OK, so the agenda has been uploaded. Um, and there's this Cody MD thing, which also has the agenda if you want to look at it. Um, mentioned the Jabber Room, the Secretariat. Uh, we have a Jabber Scribe and note takers. OK, so here's the agenda for the meeting. Um, we've gone through the preliminaries, hopefully. Um, we'll do the JPEG XS pack payload format. We'll talk about the framework marking working group less call, uh, the BP9 payload format less call. Uh, then UN and Sergio will talk about the S frame RTP encapsulation. We have a presentation on QRT, quick RTP tunneling, and then uh, we'll do wrap up. So I'm going to, a uh, little bit about draft status. Um, we've published a whole ton of RFCs. Many of them were in cluster 238. So those are now out. Are now out. Yay. Um, we have four drafts that have completed working group last call, three of which we're going to talk about today. We have one expired draft. I guess we have an action item, Jonathan, to follow up on that. Um, we've adopted three documents, uh, the EBC draft, Cryptex, and 7983 BIS. And that's about it for documents. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Tim Brellans from Intupix. So I uh, am one of the authors of the XS payload uh, format for RTP. And so uh, in December, there was a, a last call, a WGLC, but uh, no response was given uh, on the reflector uh, to the to the last call. And uh, so uh, it was said that during this meeting, we would uh, see what we had to do to proceed uh, further. In the meantime, I have uh, taken some actions. So. Uh, People from Fraunhofer actually joined the AVT core uh, mailing list. And uh, people from VSF, uh, the VO Services uh, Foundation, also uh, joined uh, this uh, mailing list in order to be able to respond to a future uh, WGLC if, if it's uh, still required. And then uh, from JPEG committee, uh, I uh, uh, asked them to draft a liaison uh, letter to IETF the AVT core uh, working group. So uh, this letter was issued 
last week and will be uh, yeah will be sent by the secretariat of uh, of ISO. I don't know I don't know when uh, it will uh, arrive here at the IETF, but uh, I hope it's uh, soon. So it's just a letter uh, that actually. Uh, the committee would also very uh, appreciate uh, the support of the RTP spec. So, in the the next slide, please. So, my question is a little bit: uh, What is the next to do in order to to uh, move the the draft uh, forward? Uh, that's uh, what I want to ask here. Yeah, I think the action item, which you should note in the notes, would be to issue the new working group last call, as you note. Okay. Yep. And possibly the chair is to actually call out to some specific people, possibly including themselves, to actually yeah. the working group last yes, call. call. Yes, that would be that would be very welcome because, of course, uh, I don't know the quality of the text. It would be very much appreciated if uh, if people with a lot of uh, knowledge on writing this kind of uh, text. And specifications uh, can also um, uh, read it and, uh, and uh, verify if everything is okay. Okay, so I guess two action items. One is uh, to reissue the working last call, and uh, I guess Jonathan and I to review it. And any other volunteers? Anyway, we'll we'll harangue you later. So, so uh, just a question for the other volunteers. Does that mean anybody from the from the AVT core members, sorry, the one that are sub subscribed to the? Well, anybody on the mailing list? Yes. Can... So I, I I know for at least uh, two other people will uh, also uh, cross read and uh, and uh, normally okay. respond. I hope they will approve, of course. But uh, we'll see. Okay. So thank that's you. that's good. Sounds like we have a plan. Okay. Thank you very thank much you. for your time. Yep. All right, uh, next item is the frame marking working group last call. Uh, so a little bit of detail about that. That was announced on the 21st of November and concluded on December 6th. Uh, we had Stefan Wenger who um, provided an initial response and then a more detailed one. Uh, Sergio and Dr. Alex uh, basically plus one that, and we'll talk a little bit about what uh, Stefan posted. And then I posted a review, which is mostly uh, NITs and a, a few other things. But um, the main comment came from Stefan, and uh, this is what he said. I won't read all of it, but you can get the general idea. He, he basically inquired, is anyone out there who continue to think frame marking as originally proposed is still a good idea and will see implementations? Um, and also questioned whether it, uh, it was necessary for future codec payload formats to have a mandatory section on how to how to do frame marking, um, it's obviously a non-trivial cost and effort, and and could grow over time. Uh, so that was Stefan's question, and that's what Dr. Alex and Sergio uh, also plus one. Um, and in, uh, Stefan provided a little bit more detail uh, on his opinion, saying that the problem is to try to provide the main RSFU with sufficient information to do its job for selective forwarding. Uh, and to do that, you have to abstract from the syntax of various codecs. It's something the SFU maker wants because they want to reuse the same logic independent of codec, but it's hard to do. Uh, and then Stefan provides some historical info on the fact that this has been tried starting in 2000. I didn't realize it was that old uh, and has we got it wrong every time, despite many, many more eyes looking into this. Um, so that's that's the basic comment from Stefan. So based on that, we decided to call for implementation experience to try to fill in what Stefan was asking. You know, what what were the implementer experiences? What has happened? Uh, what's gone wrong? What's gone right? So we got a couple of responses. I'll try to paraphrase here. If people think I haven't gotten this quite right, uh, feel free to get in the queue and speak up. But we got one response from Sergio, uh, which was with respect to VP8 and VP9 experience. Um, as I, I believe, um, one issue with VP8 was the picture ID needs to be consecutive. Um, and so if a forwarder drops a frame, basically they need to rewrite it. And that created a problem because it meant that the picture ID uh, you couldn't just have end-to-end -end encryption over the entire uh, frame with VP8. You would need to modify the TL0 PIC index and the picture ID. 
Um, this is not a problem specific to frame marking. That is, it would occur with any other RTP header extension as well. There was an issue with VP, so um, because of that, it wasn't clean to implement this with VP8. Um, and I don't believe others can speak up. I don't believe it was ever, frame marking was not supported uh, with VP8 in Chrome. I believe that's true. Um, there was also an issue with the VP9 PU bit for the temporal up switch, temporal and spatial up switch. Um, at least uh, Sergio had issues mapping that into frame marking and figure out what to do. Uh, and in addition, there are the more complex VP9 KSVC scalability modes um, were uh, not suitable for use with frame marking. So basically issues with VP8 and VP9. And then Jonathan replied back with H264, uh, which was implemented in Chrome for to basically offer support for temporal scalability, the three layers in H264 ABC in Chrome. Uh, it assumed temporal nesting, so every frame was a valid up switch point, so you didn't have the issue with the P and the U bit. It was contributed to the WeberC.org base, and I guess it was used by video and perhaps some other folks. Um, that code was subsequently removed, I think, because it wasn't as universally applicable, um, wasn't used for VP8 and VP9. Okay, I see Mo in the queue. Okay. Go, go ahead, Mo. Uh, just to clarify that um, the VP9 uh, P and U bit um, uh, issues were, were what triggered the update to frame marking uh, to uh, to add the restriction of temporal nesting. So that, that right. was in, um, I think at least four or five versions ago. Um, so I guess the real, the real question is: Do we think that that the temporal nesting restriction is too severe, and in in which case there needs to be a, a you know a solution to a more generic uh, form of marking, or do we believe that Stefan's objections mean that no form of marking will ever uh, truly be relevant for for a codec because they're just naturally, um, you know, every codec has its you know naturally expressible ways, and it's not right to try to club them all together in some generic abstract way. I think those are the two main issues that we need to to address. Yeah, those, that, that's great, great summary, Mo. Um, just a question on my part. Um, all the, the temporal modes I'm aware of, like L1, T2, and all that stuff, they're all temporally nested, right? I think so. I, I mean, I so think I guess I'm a little yeah. bit confused about what the issue was with. Yeah, I'm not, I don't think I've seen too many temporal, temporal nodes that did not have temporal right. nesting. It, it's sort of, you know, temporal nesting is kind of a you know, way of saying don't do anything crazy. Right, because exactly. So, Non-temporally nested modes are not very useful for all kinds of things you want to use temporal layers for. Right. So, anyway. so I think the point uh, on the previous slide, and Sergio can correct me, but uh, so it was really more with a spatial up switch than with a temporal. I think that's true, right? Yeah, I, I need to double check whether the, that issue got resolved in VP9. If we again, if we can. So VP8, the VP8 issue was unique to VP8 and wasn't really related to frame marking. The PU thing was more for the spatial. Um, anyway, other people uh, want to talk about implementation experience. Sergio, do you want to provide more detail here? Uh, well, the, I don't recall the details because it was a long time ago, but uh, it was mainly that I had the, the VC Lion selection for VP9, and when I tried to move to frame marking, I didn't have all the information. So I have to, um, as I was not going to, to change the <laughs> VP9 encoding in, in Chrome. I just had to map those uh, those bits in order to be able to have the same, to use the same logic that I was using before. I don't know if there could be some encoding tricks that would allow to use frame marking with that, but um, I didn't want to, to go into that detail when, when I implemented it. Yeah. And of course, now that we have the case, the, the KSBC and things like that, I don't think that it is possible to do that with, uh, with frame marking. Yeah. Um, Justin, do you want to say anything about the experience in Chrome? Yeah, to be honest, like I, I don't remember. I'm not as close to this anymore, and, and I don't remember the, the exact issues. Um, you know, I, I think they. My, my my overall understanding is that S frame and the sort of uh, approach there has largely obsoleted this. Uh, you know, f from from the, the Chrome perspective. Um, I, it, it doesn't surprise me that you know the, some of the things like KSBC and such 
you know, are, are just explicitly not covered here. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't no, think it's ever a, a goal to cover something that complex. But anyway, go ahead, Mo. Sorry, I don't think that was me. What I was saying was, I feel like what I found, you know, the most, the only, the most, which is to say, the primary useful case I saw for it, I think, which also says on my slide, is the H six four case, where you're actually retrofitting information that the codec, the payload format, doesn't carry. Um, right. So you know, so to actually provide information that you otherwise don't have. Um, but trying to, it, it is compared to, compared to the things that do try to do this natively, it's ne it's very hard to make it as rich as the payload uh, specs do, especially for anything scalable with spatially scalability. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, I guess my question is: Is this something that we still consider useful for this one use case of retro of um, of basically retrofitting temporal scalability onto ABC? Yeah, I think the reason why it was so useful is that Chrome only had H.264 ABC, so it was a way of kind of sneaking in the SVC stuff, the most popular modes, you know, without having to implement the full uh, H.264 SVC stuff. Uh, so um, I think basically the questions are those that Mo just said. You know, where do we where do we go from here? Sorry. I would just say, I say I saw another plus Q from you in the oh, okay. from go my ahead. end of you. Was that you Mo, again or yeah, yeah, ju just to um just to address the comments about different codecs. Uh, I don't I don't believe we've ever had anything where the different codecs have ever caused anything in frame marking to not uh you know to, to work differently. I, I don't believe there's anything different between two six four, VP eight or VP nine. Uh, on either temporal or spatial scalability that that prevent uh, effective marking. The only problem is whether or not the streams are temporally nested. And like Jonathan mentioned, I think you know in, in practice most implementations are temporally nested, um, but it's it's not to say that that more creative things could you know could be done with a, with a codec. So I don't think it's really a question of which codec you're carrying. It's really more a question of whether you're carrying a a complex dynamic uh, a scalability structure, or whether you're carrying a common, um, simple, static scalability structure, and frame marking is it was updated to only represent the simplest, you know, most basic temporally nested scalability structure. But it could do that for any codec. It could do that for even AV1. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're using 264 VP8 or VP9 or AV1, as long as you're not doing a dynamic, uh, complex scalability structure. What it conveys is still the same. The real question, I think, is Stefan's point of whether or not that little bit of information is useful uh, or not um, with with a complex codec and with complex scalability structures. You may want a lot more information, and in which case, you know, you you're better off trying to just expose, you know, the first few bytes of the codec payload, and maybe that's something that could be done for S frame instead of trying to normalize. Uh, some format, common format across all the codecs, just expose the the payload headers of the codecs, the first, you know, whatever bytes. Um, and maybe maybe that's a better direction if people think that they need all the flexibility that the codec provides. If they don't, if people don't expect to really, you know, innovate on their, you know, scalability structures in the codec, then I don't see why we couldn't just keep a simple, uh, static, uh, normalized, uh, descriptor like either frame marking or the AV1DD or something like, or whatever S frame decides to come up with. Um, so I think that's really the crux of the issue is whether we want to normalize something in a, in a few simple bits that will never be able to capture the full complexity of all codecs, or if we give up on that and say let's let's just expose what the codecs have um, in some you know codec specific uh, uh, blob. Hmm. I see Sergio. Thank you. Yeah, that's but there is a small thing that I don't agree is that we say that it is this works for every codec, uh, and it, the, there is a part that it is codec specific and has to be specified for each codec. So we don't have a, a, even a mechanism that works for all codecs. It works different for all codecs, so we have to implement it in an SVU. I have to implement frame marking for H264. I have to implement H marking for VP9. I have to implement frame marking for VP8. I have to implement frame marking for AV1. So even if it is uh, can be applied to any codec, 
its uh, implementation is different. So it's, it's even less helpful in that, in that regard. Yeah, but that's not a statement only about frame marking, right? It would be true for any RTP extension. I guess that's an important issue to kind of tease out here, right? Is it, uh, it would be true for anything, not just frame marking. It would be, you know, whatever we would do, right? Mm, well, I, I mean, I'm not sure about that. I mean, uh, just about frame marking. I think that, uh, for example, the and the AV1 dependency index reader is meant to be used without uh, or being kind of codec agnostic. Another thing is if it is will be able to to match all the different codecs in the future. But uh, at least it is not something that it is specific or is different to implement for each of the, of the coder. I mean. Well, it, but I think that it well the the RTP extension may not be different, but this VP8 issue, for example, right, basically says that you can't encrypt and integrity protect this this payload stuff, right? Or else, or else, you, when you no, um, yeah, it, it's not going to be valid. Yeah, this VP8 uh, was just a, a, an implementation specific issue that prevent me from implementing. So I have not. It will happen to to any, but it is uh, something that. And that it is specific to also to 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 Chrome to live with RTC. So, and but it, this is what I would, did not implement it frame marking for BP8. It's not that it cannot be implemented. Well, I think I think yeah. I mean, Jonathan's had some suggestions about how to make VP8 implementations more uh, robust, so they wouldn't create this issue. But I think if the issue is there in the implementation. Um, you know, if the idea is to support end-to-end -end encryption, you're you're going to have an issue with any RTP header extension. Yeah, I, I even think I, I submitted a patch that was not right. alert, but it, it was possible to implement PP8 without having to rewrite this 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 mm -hmm. ideas. Mo? Yeah. So the the goal uh, original goal behind frame marking and this uh, same same goal for the AV1 dependency descriptor uh, is for receivers of this uh, of this payload uh, to be able to you know um, do things uh, without digging deep into the actual uh, um, codec payload uh, and and that does that always uh, helps the people receiving it but it never helps the person that has to generate the the actual marking the, right. the, the codec the, the encoder to packetizer layer, always has to incur the complexity of understanding the payload format and building the right uh, uh, header. Even if we came up with a perfect normalized header, right. there's, there's always going to be that complexity of understanding the codec bits and, and, and lifting them up into this, into this header. So I think we should abstract that out. And, and um, I think Stefan was arguing that no matter how well you think you're doing that, it's never going to be uh, good enough. Um, so don't even bother doing that. Just expose the codec bits as they are. Don't try to normalize them into something uh, agnostic. Yeah, I guess the other issue, though, Mo, was if you're not encrypting stuff, I mean, in some codecs, it's clear what you wouldn't encrypt, right, like VP8, VP9. But in others, right, you can have, you know, in AV1, you can have, the, you can have scalability information, right, deep inside. It's not always so easy to know what you're not encrypting. Um, so I guess you could build that in somehow to S-Frame, but that, that's something to think about. Um. Sergio again? Yeah, the, the, I completely agree about the, the center side. The only thing is that frame marking, even uh, if I had to to add a new code uh, codec in, in my SVU that uses frame marking, I will have to implement something in the SVU. It's not because the, there is a codec specific part that it is not, uh, it's not the same for BP8 or BP9 or S264. So, um, even in that, you have to do something, even if it is not complex, in this for you to support new things. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it seems to me the questions are, you know, do we want to, do we, do we think frame marking is useful or do we want to abandon it? And if we do think it's useful, do we want to keep the requirement that new codecs um, uh, our must have a section describing how, it, how it's used. Yeah, also I think there's a, a little bit of an issue in that um, I think we've discovered that, at least in the case of VP8, the, having an RTP header extension may not be sufficient to do forwarding. 
In other words, if you're if you know, it should be clear that if the idea was that you didn't have to parse the payload, didn't have to touch it, and didn't have to know anything about it, I think we've demonstrated at least in VP8 that that's not realistic. But part of that is to do you know what consideration when you're designing a payload format. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think so. Uh, maybe we can get people to opine on what on the questions you've just asked, uh, Jonathan. Uh, I mean, I, I, my personal opinion is it doesn't make sense to throw away the document. There's definitely something we've learned there, um, you know. So at least we should document what 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 we learned in implementing it and and the issues involved. Um, do others have opinions on what we should do next? Mo. Well. I guess I would uh, I, I would tend to side with the use more than uh, um, than anything else. So if, if people think that they're going to use this or something like this, then I think it makes sense to continue work on it. If no one expects to use this and no one expects to use something like this, then it's not worth you know uh, iterating the doc anymore. Um, so I guess the real question is that. Um, and with all the activity happening, you know, in 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 both the AV1 de dependency descriptor and eventually with S-Frame, you know, I I struggle with you know uh, Stefan's argument that this just can't be done because everyone is still trying to do this. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's still energy in, in, in trying to do uh, this. The question is whether or not the the restrictions of having you know a simple uh, scalability structure uh, or not is. It would be the next level question. Yeah, I mean, one of the weird things about follow-on efforts is they seem to have some of the same beliefs that we've, I think, we've shown aren't true for for frame marking. And then that with the dependency descriptor, you know, it was designed for AV1, and I think it does work for that. But um, you know, one of the reasons for developing it was to solve the VPA problem, which I think we've just demonstrated it does not do. So um, I think there are things we've learned uh, we've learned about issues with trying to solve to do everything and if we make that demand of some future thing I'm not sure any future thing can solve that either um, yeah and, and I'd also highlight the the, the recent uh, issue in frameworking for VVC uh, for whether or not um, a gradual decoder refresh uh, can be signaled um, right exactly and, and that that same problem would exist with maybe one dependency descriptor and currently there's no solution exactly. for this frame either so you know, right. it's inevitable that that interesting things in the codec may you know may come up and surface that aren't captured in in uh, in any normalized uh, descriptors. So so let me ask you something, Mo. You know, what what do you think is actually doable in any RTP extension, right? Uh, I mean, I think you're making a good case that if you if you're trying to solve uh, you know, create a generic descriptor that prevent you know says you never have to parse the payload of any codec, right? That and you'll get full functionality, right? That's that's un, an unrealistic expectation, not just for frame marking, but for anything. Um, so, but people want to do this. I think there's a mo multiple motivations for wanting to do it. One is, you know, if you're an SFU developer, you really don't want to write parses for every codec. <laughs> that's just not fun. Um, so. You know, is there a trade-off of, you know, optimal forwarding versus amount of work for for parsing everything? Right. I mean, they, there could be some place where you say, yes, I acknowledge that I can't handle everything, but you know, I've saved myself enough work, and you know, I get enough agility where it's fine. I accept that trade-off. Um, I see. Q is building up. So, Magnus. Uh, yes, Magnus Westlund here. Um, yeah, I, I think this is very interesting because I think especially with S frame, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to select which information you expose because you're going to have to evaluate that information for its privacy impact. And and actually, in some cases, you, I mean, scalability normal shouldn't probably, hopefully doesn't say anything about it, but you need to evaluate it and go forward with that. And I also think if you're going to have random puncture of the encryption, to support formats to be able to read this, I mean, 
I think we end up in a situation where we also need to think about how people package the data inside the S-frame if you're going to have a blob of saying, okay, this is code specific information you think is valuable to expose that still maybe need to be gathered. So I don't see you getting away in that environment from selecting, implementing some support, et cetera. And therefore I think generalizing as much as possible for what for those use cases we know we can get work is probably the best here. And then I don't know if the answer is the saying, can we close down the scope on framework saying that this is a good enough support for this, or are we already now moving on to no, we try this, it's not good enough, but if we clarify the scope and do another extension, we can do a version two, <laughs> which actually works for our intended purpose. It's not gonna take all the cases, but yeah, that's what we're dealing with. So I think it's something to think about how we deal with this. Do you have opinions? Did you give us a rec your recommendation? <laughs> I, 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 I it might be, I mean, if no one really is implementing frameworking, it might be that the best step is actually to go to B2 directly and say, okay, let's try another approach here, which we think will, and, and be clear on which scope of functionality we want to cover. It might be the simplest here. And then we actually get better implementation support for that version two with then having two different in the market and therefore, not publishing this we other than maybe as informational at the same time as v2 comes out okay justin is next yeah i think i think my comments are largely uh, aligned with what magnus uh you know was indicating uh i i, I do think that stefan's comment of there's always going to be header stuff that you know we can't fit in this generic framework, and I do think that means we have to package our stuff you know differently. Of like you could imagine you know S frame just allowing uh, you know essentially a way to send like that metadata in the clear, um, and then like well the SFU would still have to parse it, like it wouldn't have to like puncture the encryption or like you know it wouldn't you know interfere with the encryption functionality, which I think is really the the, the fundamental piece here. Um, and so I think what that suggests is like, you know, there, there's some sort of framemarking thing where you get, I think, you know, 90% of what you want from this generic thing. And then if you want to do more, you know, you can just basically send the bits and that means the SFU or the metadata, you know, for the codec, you know, in the clear and the SFU will then have to parse that. Like, I, I think that, you know, would generally be a useful framework for a solution. You know, I think then the, the question that comes to us is, you know, is that really 90% that you get from this generic? you know, uh, set up or is it like 10%? And mm -hmm. I, I don't have a good read on that. And I think that's kind of where, uh, you know, I'd love to get, you know, the folks who worked on, you know, implementing this at, at Google to, to weigh in. Um, you know, we could pull in Harold or some of the folks there and just try to get a sense like, is this the 10% or is the 90%? You know, I think if we're on the, you know, the 10% the spectrum, then waiting for the V2 is probably the right call. Yeah, I mean, um... My understanding is the kind of, at this point, the uh, bar is being able to be useful for multiple codecs, right? I mean, if you're going to do this, you want it to be useful, usable for VP8, VP9, and H.264, and AV1, kind of. If you got that subset, that would that would be a bar that would certainly would get it into Chrome. I believe that's, that's what people believe can be done in Chrome. If that is, I think that's accurate. Uh, okay. You know, AV2 or... Whatever EBC, we don't know about that, but um, I, I think yeah. My personal view is that H two six four alone is not is not enough of a bar to uh, to take off. Sergio's next. Yeah, I just want to make one one small comment. I'm regarding because as I we are working on it on on the S frame and the generic packet extension. I think that the the goal should never be to try to have something that it is generated for all future video codecs. I mean, because we don't know what the next quantum encoder for whatever is going to look like. But I think that there are realistic uh, goals should be to, to at least make it work for all the current uh, video uh, codecs, mainly S264, S265, BP8, BP9, and, and AB1. 
I think that should be a, re a realistic goal. I mean, obviously, having we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but uh, at least we should target about current codex. So uh, while we've got you, Sergio, um, uh, what is your opinion on what to do with the document? I think that uh, I don't see the frame marking to be useful at this stage. I just think that removing it is not, I mean, it's something that we have done. So just deleting it doesn't seem nice. I think that the idea of having it as an information and probably removing the BP9 part from uh, the frame marking for BP9 and, and adding to, the, to this to this uh, document so it is, it is there's at least for historical reason, I think it would be fine, but keeping removing the requirement for next payload specs, I think that it is something that should be in because we see that there is no reason for for supporting it and probably just publishing the document, I don't know if as RFC or informational or I don't know sure what to do with that editorially. Uh, Tim is next. Yeah, um, Tim Panson. I, I, just tracking back to what Justin said, I mostly agree with the idea that something useful here is would be useful. But as, a, as somebody who's implemented a thing that looks a lot like an SFU, there are two problems that you're trying to solve here. One of which is to find the bits that you need. And that's actually sometimes more difficult than interpreting them. So I think I, if we skip the interpreting step and actually just did found the bits that would be relevant, um, that would be a huge help. But maybe that simplifies the problem. That doesn't answer the question as to what to do with the document, though. Mo? Um, yeah, I, answering the question about, uh, you know, is this 90% uh, or 10% or of what you need? Um, uh, of course, you know, uh, <laughs> authors are going to be biased because uh, you know, we wouldn't have created this if we didn't think it already captured at least 80% of what we need. Um, so I think when you when you compare it to other things, like what's going to happen eventually for S-Frame or what's, you know, already, you know, in, in progress for AV1, 90% um, of, uh, you know, the actual use of the codec is already captured in this simple uh, frame marking extension. So I, I think it already covers 90% of uh, you know, common meeting services, uh, certainly all the ones that, that I've ever either used or, or worked on. Um, the, the, that doesn't mean that it, uh, it, should, it should dumb down implementations to only use those features. So I'm, I'm struggling with whether or not uh, we should, if we publish anything, should we add text to say that, you know, uh, um, if you need to use these, you know, these types of advanced features, um, you know, here, here's how you, you should do it, or, or here's how you can do it in addition to frame marking. It's not that you can't use frame marking, it's that in order to get the extra semantics you need, you can use frame marking and, and this. Um, but I think if you look at the core of this, the, the, the exact same one byte thing is gonna be in, all, in, in any implementation, you know, in any other proposal, you're gonna have that same one byte thing. You know, frame, start a frame, end a frame, uh, independent or not, uh, all those same things exist in any kind of abstraction you could ever come up with. Right, and in fact, they are in, all of those things are in the dependency descriptor. Uh, Sergio? Yeah, I just, that I disagreed with the, I mean, it's obviously yes, but, uh, we cannot be scientific here, but I disagree with the with the percentage about how useful frame marking is. Because, for example, KSBC is not supported, and for example, uh, we are using it now for screen sharing. If I recall correctly, that how what how uh, well I don't know if we were in Google Meet, uh, we will be using for screencast. I mean, so it is uh, something that uh, it is not implemented and it is widely used. So. It is, uh, I say that using the, the the basic SBC types is not cover eighty percent of the of the cases. But I mean, it's just minor minor comment. Yeah. So I, I think certainly it's possible to you know upgrade the document to discuss more 
I mean, a document already says what it's usable for, right? Temporally nested, which is not KSVC, so you could add some more info on that. Um, that would be easy to do. Um, maybe so, some uh, of the, yeah. So, sorry, I see my signal again. Mo? Oh uh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you were saying earlier. Uh, the, uh, the, the reason we didn't add the information about VP9 in the spec was, was the work group didn't want to add uh, uh, stuff for uh, just drafts. Um, but uh, if, if people want the, you know, the details about how to, how to use uh, VP9 modes, including KSVC, and how, do you, how you set the PNU bits, uh, we could certainly add that to the document if, if, if you know, people don't have an objection to having that documented in, in, in this spec. Um, but the, the updates were made specifically to add th those those things, um, to to allow those things. But we didn't document how to use them with VP9 because we were told to remove the VP9 section from the spec. Right. I mean, I think the issue is that you framework can't distinguish in KSVC, at least as currently in KSVC and regular SVC, and thus provide a SFU information as to what it needs to forward. Right. But I don't I mean, think. Yeah, I mean, I agree up. that you know any description is going to need to include the information in frame marking. The question is: Is there ever a case where the information in frame marking is sufficient? And I think that's you know you know and if if you can have frame marking if you need to have frame marking plus some other information you get somewhere else, I think it's not um, terribly useful. Yeah. I mean, you know, other than having a some, you know, some, you know, not having to rewrite your parsers all the time, which is you know moderately useful, but not you know terribly exciting. So, um, just trying to come up with what the next steps are. Um, what What do you think we ought to do, Jonathan? Do you want to have some hums, or where do you think we should go from here? Uh, yeah, I guess maybe we need to have hums. Um, what would the first one be? Would that be on something like the publication status? I mean, I guess, you know, maybe just, do you think we should still go ahead with publishing frame marking as something? Okay. Uh, did everyone get that hum? So the first question is, should, should we publish this doc, document at all? Is that the hum, Jonathan? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So that's our first time. Is should we publish this document at all? Uh, and uh, how about uh, got a whole bunch before of before that? I see. I see Ronnie running in the queue. So okay. Ronnie, do you want to say something before the home? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, if you change this, then you have a requirement that any other every new code have a framework. If you change information, I think, then how require that? I think your question, Ronnie, was about uh, whether future codex should be required to support it. You'd like to yes. have a hum on that? Yeah. Have a hum no, on I that? Really, if you have information, why, how can you have Well, I think, well, I mean, after we do, you know, we decide whether to publish, if we do decide to publish it, then we could decide, you know, if we know what we want to require of future codex. Right. So if we're going to try to use the hand raise tool for the hum, which is kind of misusing the tool because it's actually meant to ask to speak, but whatever. Um, so I guess uh, if you think this should be published as something, click the hand raise tool, which is in the lower uh, left. I'll try to. Can you see uh, everyone who's raising their hand, Jonathan? I I can't from where I am, but yeah, I can because I'm I'm in tile view. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. I think I see six people saying we published. 
and you think we should not publish this, or everybody, you know, please clear your raise hand if you voted for that. And now, if you think we should not publish this, raise your hand now. Uh, I think I see, I think I saw three, it's, they're sort of coming and going. Bernard, are you raising your hand that's not published? Uh, no, I raised it for publishing. Okay. Now I can't hear you. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was I was they pushed the talk and not pushing. Um, yeah, no. It sounded like there was. I saw a six for for publish and two for not publish. So it sounds like you know weak rough consensus. For we should still publish this. Yeah, of course we will verify in the mailing. Yeah, list. of course. Yeah, yeah. That's where we are now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the next um, uh, publication status? Yeah. Do we still want to do this as PS? Okay. Um, So I guess if you still want to do this as, if if you want to do this as proposed as a proposed standard, raise your hand now. Uh, I think we should publish it. Okay. Um, actually, Magnus, do you have something to say before we? Yes, I think it's hard to answer this question because I think we need to actually figure out if we have something better than frame marking to publish or not. Well, I mean, the, the tricky thing there is I think the thing that you know we have in the broad sense is not the thing that we have in the IETF sense because yeah. it's been and, done and by also the right, until, media. And also until things are actually implemented, Magnus, we don't know if the bird in the hand may not be better than the one in the bush, right? Mm. <laughs> no, and then and, and maybe yes, from that perspective it might be better to yes. This is basically done, ship it, and then we get to replace it if we find something better. That might be a way, but yeah. Um, I just wonder if it sends the wrong message somewhere or not, but that's, uh, that this is. I mean, there are potential. That research should be published as experimental. <laughs> um, I didn't know if you had experimental on your list. Of intended status. I did. I wasn't thinking. I I, I would been thinking informational, but experimental might also work. Um, so what is uh, what hum do you want to go ahead with? I I guess I don't know. I'm. I'm... Well, why don't we hum on proposed standard and then if see okay. where we get with that proposed okay. standard? Yes or no? Okay. Yeah. Proposed standard. Yes. Um, All right, I only see one. And uh, something other than proposed standard? I think I saw seven. So yeah, it sounds like consensus for something other than proposed standard. I mean, whether that's do people want to speak as to experimental versus informational, or is that just, uh, or is that getting too much into the weeds for uh, for palms? It's a bunch of people in the queue, I think. Uh, are they? Are they? Or are they? Well, are you still? Are you in the queue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you are. Sorry, I'm getting. Yeah, um, just a, a procedural issue. Are, are, are we are we humming on? Um, are, are we discussing the current revision of the document? Or are we discussing any possible future revision? You know, including changes. Um, it wasn't clear to me whether or not we're just saying what's in there now. Just publish that, or we want to document some things, or maybe even make a normative change to enhance something. That that part wasn't clear to me. No, um, well, it's because I didn't ask. Does anybody want to speak to that? Um, 
Uh, Ronnie, are you raising your hand for the hum, or are you raising your hand because you want to speak? <laughs> you want to, if you want to speak, please use the, the plus Q uh, and minus Q. Q yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, apparently, nobody has an opinion on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, obviously, you know, we could take this and, you know, completely rewrite it to be, you know, the heavy one DD for if you know, in an extreme case. But um, that's yeah. I mean, just just my personal opinion. Um, I think it's important to publish it with what we and document the issues because if we don't at least do that, that we have learned things and that will get lost and that would be bad. Um, so I think we have to document what we have. I wouldn't personally try to fix every issue with it because I think that would turn it into something else. We have something that was implemented. We learned from it and just try to encapsulate that document and publish it. And make it clear what it does do and what it doesn't do. Right? Just leave it at that. Um, Magnus? Yeah, I I think that's the right way forward. Looking, okay, what's the easiest if, uh, smaller fi If there's small easy fixes, roll them in. Otherwise, just document, push it out. And I, I would say experimental with the same. We know certain parts of this might work fine. Other parts is a bit shaky. And, and we're saying that the experiment to see if, if there's actually anything better. I mean, getting some experience made it potentially and otherwise we're working on why we're looking at other designs too so mm -hmm. but uh, i think that's probably the reason so not hold it up too long then get it out right. the door and then we can re replace it later if we find something better okay so i think we may have exhausted this topic we have a bunch of other things to try to get to in the meeting and we're about 20 minutes over for this slot in the agenda yeah. So I think, uh, thank you, everybody. I think we uh, we will bring it to the list, obviously, um, and try to. Uh, I think we have good guidance. All right. So the VP9 payload format, uh, Jonathan. Uh, yeah. So fortunately, the only open issue with this was what to do with, with frame marking, which is why I wasn't too worried about rolling frame marking over. Um, so it sounds like I I would say, and I'll ask if people agree with me that maybe the thing to do is move the description of how to do VP9 with frame marking into the frame marking document, um, take it out of the VP9 spec, and go ahead and publish VP9. Does anybody disagree with that plan? Sounds good to me. And you know, uh, and also include within that you know, your experience with VP9 implementation, or lack of same. Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, exactly. But and but, especially because, like I said, the, this VP9 as as written is what's been shipping in Chrome for I think at least four years now or something. So we want to get that published. And I apologize for it taking so long. Sounds like a lot of looks like a lot of plus ones in the chat room. So yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, I guess if, uh, make sure that that's good. reflected in the notes and we can sort of catch up on time. Okay. All right. So. Uh, we're going to turn this over, I guess, UN. You'll be presenting on um, S-Frame RTP encapsulation. Hi. Um, Bernard, can you share the slides? Or I believe I am. Can you see them? Oh, no, I'm not seeing them. OK. Well, that's OK. Um, Are you seeing it now? I, I can... think you, you might need to explicitly click on Bernard in the, in the, um, oh. the slide. The, uh, so so you're levels. seeing the slides, Jonathan, right? I am seeing yeah. the slides, yeah. OK. Okay. I am seeing uh -huh. the slides too. Okay. okay. I think I think I need to switch to Chrome. There might be. Ah, I'm seeing the slide, but not always. So. Okay. In the meantime, um, so Sergio and I, based on our last uh, meeting, um, started to. Okay. Join the meeting. Um, Are you okay? UN? 
Okay. We're not hearing you, Yuan. Are you trying to get something working? I think you might be trying to join from Chrome. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm seeing the slide now. Um, okay. Let's go to yeah the goals. Um, so from last meeting, uh, Sergio and I started to dive into how to support Edframe. And more generally, installation, uh, which uh, both are breaking the assumption that uh, from the encoder to the packetizer, nothing happens. So that the packetizer can no longer assume that uh, encoded data is, is correct. And um, certainly, we could try to update a stream or install streams to try to handle that. But it does not; it's not really tractable. Uh, to handle that with existing codecs and future codecs as well. So it might be better to, to find with a solution that, that is more generic and minimize impact uh, on intermediaries like this user browser. And maybe uh, if we have a good solution, uh, it can actually get us some bonus like simplification, like no need for new packetizer implementation in ACFU or in browsers, at least for WebRTC. Uh, next slide. So, what's, what we, uh, we broke uh, the, the things in three parts. First, uh, given the change of S frame or installable streams, um, we need to change a bit of a processing model. Uh, the packet, packetizer can no longer really split frames. Uh, so, it's really up to the application that is doing the transform to actually do it. Uh, on the wire, of course, some, change, some changes are needed. Um, so we thought of using a generic packetization uh, with side channel information so that intermediaries can still do uh, their current processing, like uh, root packets, or even process packets, because somehow a browser that is receiving content is also an intermediary to, to the web page. And if we change what goes on the network, of course, we, we need a way to negotiate. So uh, let's look at all these three things, starting with processing model. Next slide. So the proposal there is hopefully simple and straightforward. So the encoder is generating a frame. The application is modifying the frame. And the idea would be that the application may be able to split the encoder frame in individual subframes. And the packetizer, the generic packetizer, would then work on each individual subframe as an independent frame to transmit. If we look at uh, an example like using H.264 with a frame, it's almost like today. H.264 encodes a frame, we encrypt it, and then packetizer sends it as one frame. Uh, in over applications like SVC, where on the decoding side, you might actually want to decrypt uh, different layers independently. It's good if the application is splitting each layer in its own individual frame that the packetizer will then process independently. And the same could be applied to uh, even H264. If for whatever reason, an application wants to split frames an H264 frame uh, in two because there are good reasons for that, then it can be done. Uh, it's really up to the application to, to do it. Um, next slide. So once we have uh, individual frames, uh, we need to send them on the network. And there, the idea would be to, uh, given the frame is just opaque data and metadata, uh, we could put the opaque data in the, uh, in the, as the payload, and the packetizer would do nothing on the payload, would not prepend data, would not depend, wouldn't do nothing but, except splitting it into RTP packets. So we, we, we get a very dummy uh, packetizer, very simple to implement. Uh, of course, it works with any codec. And all the complexity is less is uh, left to the frame metadata that is sent as an RTP header extension. So if we look at S frame, uh, the idea would be that what is double encrypted, very high pro highly protected, 
it's in the payload. And what is still necessary to leak to intermediaries, then it's an RTP header extension. With Sergio, we started to uh, uh, enumerate uh, what's needed, and it's really similar to uh, fr what frame marking is actually doing, like codec, profile, frame type. Uh, we think we think it's interesting to look at what Instable Streams is also exposing prior to transform uh, as a source of inspiration as well. Um, that does not mean that uh, the proposal would uh define its own rtp head extension uh, maybe there's a place where things can be uh, split like uh, a base rtp head extension and uh, application specific rtp head extensions as well for advanced cases uh, we have not yet uh, thought deeply deeply there um, um injecting myself yeah. individual um so you described that you know it's, things are very flexible for the packetizer. Does that mean things are complicated for the depacketizer? Because it has to be prepared for any possible thing the packetizer could have done. And it might be helpful to describe this in terms of what a receiver and Okay, go ahead. So the depacketizer uh, processing is very simple. It needs to uh, know when uh, there's a new frame that is started. So it's just RTP processing. And when it ends, that's that's about it. And then what it will do is concatenate all all these um, blobs into one big frame and pass it to the transform, pass it over uh, to the transform that will do processing before sending it to the decoder. Hey, also, I think that I would like to to, to add that as um, we wanted to clarify some some grounds before going to to the detail about what a frame is. Because if not, we can get lost about deciding if we should go to slices or whatever and or frames. So I think that there is a lot of work that we can agree on before going to, to that fine detail that it, it will be easy, it will be difficult to agree on, but will be easy to implement. So okay. I think that, that it is um, our goal now is to try to 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 not define what gets into the packetizer, but just define uh, how the packetizer will work and uh, and and with the Splitting the, the, what comes into uh, into several packets and how the metadata is sent and how it is negotiated. When we agree to that, we can just decide how we apply that to the codex. If we want to go to deeper to slices or we want to just have frames or whatever. But okay. in, we felt that if we start discussing out the, the specific this specific topic, we might skip all the other things that uh, will allow us to progress further. Okay. I see Magnus in the queue. <clears throat> yes, so I, I think that's actually quite reasonable to look at because in some sense, this RTP payload format is going to be so possible to misuse or is it misuse and misuse. You can use it in any way and you could even throw multiple sources, multiple streams into one single SSRC and, and be done with all the things about how efficient the repair mechanism works, etc. But and, and I think that's where this becomes, goes from the very basic payload format that I agree would probably be fairly straightforward to that generic designs and what responsibility falls on the packetizer above the S frame. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how that describes and how you get that interaction between that level and RTP and what it implies for RTP. And I, I mean, that's probably a separate or it's at least a side part of this document or maybe model for S frames and RTP usage because that's just gonna be needed because that what's been spent, what we are spending time, has been spending time in AVD core about payload formats to understand what's the best way of doing. That suddenly ends up in that high level discussion what you put in the S frame and not in this RTP payload format specifics. So. Yeah. Colin? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I kind of sort of echoing Magnus's comment. Um, it's not clear how much, if any, of RTP is left once you've done this. And you know, m m maybe it is time to, re to replace it, but 
you know, this, this seems to be just saying that, you know, all, all of this effort we've put into payload formats and um, you know, signaling and, and different source identifiers and different recovery mechanisms and all of that isn't, isn't important and we can just do it all in a generic way. Um, so th this seems like a, a really quite startlingly large change to be proposing as a payload format. So, so I'm a little nervous about scope here. Well, but uh, mm, again, I'm not sure if uh, we should discuss about the scope because I mean it was already agreed that we were going to go with uh, we were already going to to work on this. But anyway, there uh, this only uh, is for the. Um, is that I, 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 don't, I don't think you can say that it's out of, uh, that, that we no, no, no. cannot have this discussion. No, I mean, and, but I mean that uh, not regarding, I mean, about this, uh, this is, this uh, slides, because I mean, what we were talking is to present this, I mean, uh, discussing about if um, this is relevant or not. I mean, we did it last time and we agreed that we were going to present this. Anyway, regarding the what the RTP, uh, we are only talking about replacing the, the codec specific RTP packetization for each uh, packet. I mean, the NAC, the FEC, Everything else is still RTP, so I would say that it's. Um, but, but but that's fundamental to the way RTP works. That's that's been in there as a fundamental feature of the way we handle codecs in RTP yeah, and the way we I, handle yeah. recovery in RTP and the way we handle signaling in RTP uh, since day one. And and you're saying to replace it all. That that's that's not a small change. Probably no, but there is no other word to, to this. There is no other word, way to support a frame. So <laughs> I mean, I would love to support a frame with current mechanisms, but it is not it is well, not so, possible. So, so, I, so I, uh, I, I'm not sure I necessarily believe that. Um, but I think my more fundamental point is, if you have decided the mechanisms by which RTP supports this are not appropriate, maybe rather than building something which isn't actually you know, using. 90% of RTP's features uh, and calling it RTP, maybe we should just do the, the new thing. I, I, I don't agree that we are using like no RTP at all. We, we are still planning uh, to use RTP headers. Um, we, we're still planning to, 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 to use what's available. It's, um, but, but you're not if, if you look at the implementations, it, so, I, um, if, if you look at how, for instance, it's done for audio, uh, it's done in, in a certain way. Um, and video is different, that's for sure. And I agree that uh, like all the work where that was done to do codex specific packetization has some benefits. And with this approach, we lose some of these benefits. So we, we need to document this and compare with the benefits, and if we if we're seeing that we we're getting more with this approach than we are losing, then I, I think we should go ahead. So it's why it would be uh, very beneficial. Um, there's a GitHub repo where we could start discussing all the benefits and uh, what what we are losing, and it would be great if you could uh, provide input uh, input there, uh, raise issues, and precise exactly what we are losing there. Um, so I, I, I am raising issues, and I can raise the issues in the working group. Thank you. We don't have to go to GitHub to do them. We have the working group session, such as this, to raise the issues. Yeah, but it's good to be able to continue discussion uh, and, during I mean, having them in, in. I mean, having them in writing rather than in speech uh, and explicit is probably helpful. So whether that's on GitHub or yeah. on the list is fine, but probably. Um, the other thing is, I, I I completely agree that it's a change. Uh, and we should not do it lightly. Um, but we, we need to, to get to uh, precise issues. Uh, if, if it's like, oh, we, we've not done this, we decided to not go there during uh, uh, 20 years, and now we are planning to, to go there, and we should not try to do it because that's not how we, we've done it. That's not great. If it's more to say, hey, there's this issue there, and you cannot solve it, with what you're proposing, then it, then it's great to uh, to try to tackle this precise issue, but, but, and we can but, make but progress what on. What what I'm saying is not um, don't consider this. What I'm saying is that if you're going to build something which basically throws away most of RTP, 
then throw away RTP and do it different. Use a different base because you're not Why? using most of RTP's features here. You know, the, the result isn't really RTP anymore. So ra right. rather than trying to shoehorn it in. I yeah. don't understand that. Yeah, so what might be helpful, and I, I don't think we'll do, be able to do it here, but at some point, maybe in our next meeting, UN, would be to talk about mm -hmm. how insertable streams work. So I guess everyone's on the same page. Because, uh, and this may be, in fact, another issue, but insertable streams does use, try to use the RTP infrastructure, um, whether, you know, it has its own issues, but um, that might be a useful thing just to get everyone on the same page at, at some future meeting. I see Justin in the queue. Justin? Justin, I, you're muted if you're talking. Sorry, my headset cut out right as you prompted me. I didn't hear the prompt. Uh, I, I was going to agree with you in that uh, you know we are using a, a significant amount of features of, of RTP, you know, everything from the header you know, to recovery mechanisms to SSRCs, uh, you know, the, the, the features that are used for uh, recovery uh, you know, in, in VO, I think is a, is a pretty small fraction. And so anyway, I, I agree we should try to like get the issues documented here on the mailing list or in GitHub or whatever. And then we can try to understand like, you know, are these like really critical issues? Um, yeah, I think it's a lot of great, you know, stuff, you know, even just the encryption mechanism that we're getting for the outer uh, encryption encapsulation, you know, is providing a lot of value. So like, I, I think we're actually getting a lot of benefit rather than trying to go do a new thing, which would, you know, have a lot of unknowns. Uh, Magnus, you're next. Yes, so <laughs> I, I, I'm quite convinced that there's great possibility to use a lot of the RTP functionality with S-frames. What I see as the issue here is, is that Colin and the others, you're talking past each other because you haven't, we need a document that actually describes how you can utilize them. I know that some stupid implementations will not use it, but at least have something that describes, here's the, here is the features of RTP, here is how you actually use them so you can get this benefit because of what exists in RTP, for example, repair and all these two other things. But that needs to be described. Um, and I mean, looking, for example, at some of the <coughs> grouping, et cetera, and, and how the streams relates to codex, et cetera, and especially for the scalable codex, and you can actually maybe have some flexibility to do things which wasn't as easy to do with RTP, here for experimentation etc in this framework in the end but i think we need something which actually talks a little bit about the architecture of this change and how you use rtp from the higher level when you have the flexibility here which s frames is gonna because s frames is gonna hide things and you're gonna write your own code for this potentially yeah, I I, I agree with that. I mean, we have to have it. The only thing is that I think that it is too early to, to have it. Uh, and also because it depends on the, some discussion that are happening in S-frames. So uh, at the end, we will have to have this, this, this for sure because we cannot expect to have it interoperability between endpoints if we don't write that document. The only thing is that uh, I would prefer to, to start this, that it is easier and also get feedback from S-frame and to advance that document in a, in a later stage when, when we also know how S-Frame is, is going to look like. Okay. Is it reasonable to expect that we'd have that by ITF 110, Sergio? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I asked Mo is last in the queue at the moment. Yeah, I think uh, the, the mental model that I have uh, for, for S-Frame um, impact to RTP is similar to RED or FEC or other things that also impact packetization. So I think if we, if we don't look at this as we're redefining the packetization of the fundamental codec, we look at this as we're, we, we're a wrapper. We're providing a privacy wrapper, just like RED provides a redundancy wrapper, and FEC provides you know, a, a, a resilience wrapper. Um, I think if we look at it that way, then there probably are still a lot of pieces of RTP that could still be used. Um, and we just define the extra bits that these uh, that these extra transforms do in the same way that Red or FEC would have defined them, and we still have the fundamental RTP packetization described in whatever uh, you know negotiation you're using. If you're using SDP, you still 
negotiate the actual codec and its actual payload format and parameters. But then this transform is an additional payload type that you're that you're sending that transforms it. And maybe you send none of the original payload type and only this transformed one. But I think that's that's doable and workable. Yep. Um, we have some slides just after that, but uh, tries to give examples of uh, how we could we could do that with SDP and how it would relate with payload types. So wanna you wanna go there? Uh, just wondering yeah, maybe. what to do with your uh, remaining. I see Colin in the queue, do you want I mean what we're on we're getting yeah, sure. plan, so yeah, so, so I, I was just going to say that, that I mean, that maybe Mo, what Mo is suggesting matches what, what's being proposed, but it's not, you know, that, that's not what I'm getting from this description. So, so I do think we need to have that architectural discussion and sort of, you know, sort of get, get a clear description of what, what's, you know, at the, the high level description of what's being proposed before we dive into the details. Because I think some of us are looking from one angle and some are looking from another angle, as Magna said, and we're talking, you know, we're very much talking past each other. And, you know, the, the, the people proposing this perhaps have a different view of what's being proposed to, to, to some people who, who are sort of coming at it from, from uh, different viewpoints. And, and, you know. Um, Jonathan, a uh, question. We have uh, the rest of this presentation plus another one. How do you propose to manage the time? Um, I don't know. I was just wondering that. Um, what do people think? Do we want to do this and skip quick RDP tunneling, or do people want to go quick RDP tunneling? Can always schedule another interim if yeah, I'm useful. Yeah, absolutely, or you know, it's, it's not that long to march either. Um, let's. I think let's. We seem to be having an active discussion on this, which is, I think, how, how much? How many more slides are there on this? Quite a few. Uh, yeah, a few. Like there are various options, but maybe I can skip for them. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like maybe we need like better fundamentals clarification, which it sounds like is somewhat. This thing is more over. Yes, maybe we should say, you know, encourage the you know authors of this to give more of that general overview, yeah. and then I think, yeah, I think that would make more sense rather than getting into a whole SDP negotiation discussion right now. Okay. The only thing is that um, we already gave that that overview last in last IETF meeting. I mean, that's yeah, why we I agreed mean, to maybe, propose. Maybe, maybe, maybe possibly you should have a side conversation you know privately with the people who don't seem to you know with, i mean you know, i i would agree with that the yeah. thing is that we, we yeah, were to, to yeah. present a, to present a draft here in this meeting yeah um, because we provided our review in last one so if we want to if we are going to stop this this draft now and wait i have next meeting to present the same thing that we are we presented last one yeah. um colin did you yeah want I'm, I'm still not exactly sure how we could uh what 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 is it exactly asked for, for us to to provide yeah. uh what additional information is requested so it would be good to clarify uh precisely the next steps and what is the yeah. ask there uh, yeah. certainly one next step is to have a draft um right i mean i mean that that, that was what i i was going to say I, I, think, I think we need a draft that describes how this fits to the rest of rtp because um you know I, you know the, the you know, clearly the people who are pushing this think they have provided an overview but um i i am i, I still have a, a bunch of um you know I, it doesn't seem like we, we have a clear understanding of how this works from my point of view uh, and so, there's a, a um, lot of assumptions which is oh, you know, as Michael okay. says there are a lot of assumptions here which don't seem to be written down anywhere yeah so that okay maybe maybe, maybe Colin, we we can we can start an email thread uh yeah, i think you'd, you know an email thread or maybe even a side discussion between maybe the authors of this and sounds like Colin and maybe Magnus are the ones who are most have the architectural okay. questions. Because so yeah. I, I'm not quite sure exactly what I should clarify. So it would be good if you could like provide uh yeah, we need to clarify the clarifications. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. But <laughs> yeah if, if we know what I mean I, I will be very yeah, I mean 
I would love to, to clarify, but I would need to, to know exactly what are the doubts and concrete doubt that we can so we can answer that. I mean, well, I mean, I, I have I haven't seen anything which describes how this fits into the RTP architecture. And, and so do, do you want an implementation? That. Well, that that I might be that's kind of a no. I want a spec. Yeah. Because, <laughs> well, if you have an implementation, you have a spec, really. <laughs> so I can I can provide you an implementation if that's what it's needed. Uh, okay. you, and, you and Sergio, I, I think I think I know how we can move forward with that. Uh, I propose in the spirit of time that we take that offline. The three of us speak mm -hmm. a little bit, okay. and then we come back to to Colin. Okay. Yeah. Good. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right. So we have six minutes left. Um, <laughs> is that enough time to talk about quick RTP tunneling? I suspect maybe not. Um, I, I can probably do my talk in about five minutes uh, okay. if so I talk if quickly. Willing, if you're willing to do that? Uh, why don't we go to that then? Okay, Samuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, hello, my name is Sam Hurst, and I'd like to talk today about my internet draft for carrying RTP sessions over quick transport, which I'm calling QRT. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so for some context, I have recently been doing a lot of work in the form of uh, doing IP contribution for broadcasting events. Uh, so how do we get video from remote production crews back to a base to use live events? Uh, we currently use RTMPS, which is a little archaic at this point, with no support for more modern video and audio codecs, which, thanks to uh, the hard work of everyone in the AVT core, we can do things like HEVC and VVC and VP9 or whatever we wanted to do. Um, so we've been looking at other protocols such as High Vision's UDT-based SRT and the Video Services Forum's RTP-based RIST. Uh, our requirements for an IP contribution protocol include strong encryption for authenticity protection, as well as good codec support and low latency streaming. Uh, in order to carry multiple RTP sessions on one sort of logical packet flow, uh, we noticed that RIST wraps RTP sessions in a set of GRE over UDP se uh, sessions. Uh, and Quick's concept of streams gave me the idea of doing this over Quick instead. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Quick, Quick is built on top of UDP uh, and, with, and it has selective acknowledgement for loss detection uh, and has uh, full TLS 1.3 encryption uh, built right into the uh, protocol. Uh, in addition, it has other features like connection migration, uh, which allows a quick client to move between different networks for reliability and performance reasons. Uh, and while Quick is normally a fully reliable protocol, there is a datagram extension which allows you to carry data that is acknowledged by the protocol, but the application can control any ARQ behavior or for retransmissions and that sort of thing on top. Uh, next slide, please. So with Quick's datagram extension frame, uh, QRT is a relatively simple mapping of RTP on top of the datagram frame uh, within Quick Transport. Uh, I've deliberately designed the system with the goal of supporting the carriage of several RTP sessions uh, down a single RTP tunnel, as, uh, as it is. Uh, and I'm uh, replacing the traditional RTP, RTCP port pair uh, with an opaque flow identifier, uh, which is similar to how uh, the Quick Streams work, if you're uh, familiar with that. Uh, and Quick, QRT uses Quick Selective Acknowledgement to satisfy the conditions of the RTCP generic NAC framework. Uh, so it, the uh, application will feed that information back in uh, for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an example use case uh, to show how QRT can carry several independent RTP sessions over uh, several QRT flow identifiers. Uh, and this is just an example of remote production that I came up with. Uh, so everything in the blue box is a single tunnel. Uh, and we're just doing multiple RTP sessions down there. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another example which shows one of Quick's beneficial features, which is connection migration. Uh, so once the client comes into the range of another network which has fewer ha hops or potentially more bandwidth, they can swap to the other network without interrupting the connection as far as the client application is aware. This can also be used in the case of one network connection dies or becomes unusable for any other reason. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and finally, the status of the QRT draft. I've published a new draft 01 earlier today, uh, and I'm starting to work on a first step implementation to use for some experiments and knowledge gathering. Uh, as for the future of the draft, I've got a list of different things which I'm looking into adding to the draft, which I've got on screen there. Um, uh, happy to consider any other features as well. Uh, I noticed that there's a few questions that have just popped up on the screen. Um, so well, we don't have very much time, but I see Spencer first in the queue. Yeah, so this is just a, a uh, silly question, but I should ask it for the chairs. Uh, so this draft is uh, 
the draft file name is uh, targeted the, to the quick working group. Is this is ABT Core the right place for this so that uh, uh, refiling it with a different draft name would get this more attention for the right people? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think it's it's probably sort of an open issue. What's the right working group? But I'd be kind of say it's probably in scope, though possibly with some charter tweaking if necessary. We need to look over what the current charter says. Um, I mean, personally, this this seems very timely because Quick has got an uh, open activity to uh, uh, do new chartered activity. Uh, you know, now that they're getting V1 out. So it seems like a, an excellent time to have that conversation. Thank you. May, uh, may I clarify as transport AD here? Sure. <laughs> the, the intention here really for quick working group is to focus on quick extension, etc. And it's not clear here what's, if it's just protocol mappings, mapping onto quick for a protocol like this, I would say that's mostly related to the working group where that pro original protocol gets get the mapping it should be. So I would say this is probably AVT course matter more than it's quick. If there's need for extension, et cetera, for to realize this, then it's it's a matter of interacting with quick working group. Yeah. I, I, so so far there's no actual uh, interaction on that side with any extra extension frames in quick or anything like that it's it's purely a protocol mapping at the moment yeah. um it depends so it might, on so it might be a good idea to republish this as a, as a draft your name avt core rather than draft your name quick oh, okay right that's fine yeah. uh I, I i think the name mainly came from quick rtp tunneling and it just has to have, happen to have quick fine, yeah. Yeah, I, I can republish it name at the end. Yeah. yeah i can do that uh I justin think... is next in the queue i think that we're done for that topic uh, so we've looked into this uh, several times over the past you know, five years, and uh, one of the key sort of underlying problems ends up being that both Quick has congestion control, and uh, you know the RTP has its own congestion control uh, ideas, and these things like uh, are, are hard to kind of decouple. Like, is this something that you have been able to solve? Uh, so by using the datagram frame, uh, we, we saw we don't entirely negate any. Uh, sort of connectional flow control in the quick space, but it, it we're just sending UDP packets and using uh, the the quick uh, transport encryption. Uh, right. Realistically. Or... Yeah. So Datagram, Datagram is an extension there. frame, but that that's still subject to the quick ingestion control envelope. So right. like that ends up being a pretty fundamental problem. Uh, yeah. I I I think with I've been trying to keep up to speed with with exactly what congestion control in the datagram frame uh, is uh, means at the moment. Uh, and it, it, this is sort of something which I'm sort of really hoping to experiment with when I get that far. Uh, and I, I'm sort of just lobbing backwards, packets backwards and forwards at the moment. Uh, so I don't really have an, a, a, a firm answer on that just yet. Um, since we're almost all out of time, I just want to get clear on what the next steps are. I guess Jonathan, you suggested republication as an AVT core document. Well, I mean, as a as a document, as an it still is an individual document, but as an individual as a, document, but yeah, targeted as um, AVT core. Yeah. Um, are there other next steps? Should we, assuming that's done, would would you are you interested in review comments? Um, uh, what, absolutely, yeah. So any and all review comments on this uh, are great. Uh, uh, on the next slide, which is my last one, I've actually got a link to a GitHub project uh, where I, I I collate issues and things on it. Uh, so if you can raise stuff there, or you can send me an email directly, uh, or do it on the mailing list and I'll see it. Uh, I'm more than happy to take any feedback uh, from anyone uh, on it. All right, as I mentioned, we're out of time, but I think I think we can probably, you know, this is probably, see there seems to be interest in this. So probably I suspect we'll, you know, have this on the agenda at our next, at either at you know the March meeting or if we have another interim. That's right. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, everybody. I think we're done for the day.
Oh, and uh, there's one comment uh, also on the chat. Please make sure that the you know, try to attract um, attend. You know, probably bring it to the attention of the quick working group as well. Even if this is going to be the group that probably owns the any subsequent work on that, just so that that group is aware of it. That's Jenna pointing that out in the chat. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, um, and we will see you uh, whenever our next meeting is. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye.